This is episode 270 of the Real Mian Colon A Movie Podcast. On this week's episode, Chase and Joel will take a look at the plethora of movie news and movie trailers that they missed while they were on their hiatus, and then they will also have the reviews of Jordan Peele's new film, Us, and Joel will have his review of the 2019 version of Dumbo. What will they think of each movie? Who who knows? We'll just have to listen to find out all that more on today's Reel Me In. What is going on, everybody? And welcome to another episode of this wonderful movie podcast you have chosen to listen to on this uh, beautiful sunny day here in uh, Dallas, Texas. Uh, you know, Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex. It's just a nice little day out. It's been kind of cold and rainy, but uh, um, yes, welcome. If you are a new listener, what we what we typically do on this show, as mentioned in the intro, we'll go over some movie news, movie trailers, and kind of give you our commentary on that. And then we will also have reviews of movies that you know have come out in the past few weeks or the current week that we're doing. You know, it just kind of depends on what we're doing. But that's kind of what um, this show is all about. It's just a long form movie discussion and uh hopefully you guys will hear some arguments from my co-host and i it just makes it more entertaining but uh we we seem to agree on a lot of stuff so i know i know it's kind of boring but we we try to spice it up uh if you're a returning listener uh welcome back uh yes this is episode 270 and we will be going over the new jordan peele film us and then joel will have his review of dumbo this is gonna be quite a fun show because you know us has been kind of garnering all this attention, uh, whether people like it or dislike it, and all the theories behind it. So it's just really cool to kind of dive into it, and I'm really excited to do that. Uh, before I throw it over to uh, Joel, um, if you guys could like this uh, episode or share it around, do what you need to do to help support us. We really appreciate it. Um, you guys are the best. Speaking of Joel, Joel, uh, what is going on over there? Uh, I have not seen you in two weeks. Um, you refused to text me, and so I have no <laughs> idea what's going on in your life, and i uh, you know what, what's been going on with you, and I'm sure I'm sure our listeners would like to know because you know it's, it feels like it's been a month. It feels like it's been uh, quite a long time since we've done this. Yeah, it's it's been it's been crazy. A lot has happened. Um, and yes, listeners, we Chase and I have a, a purely like professional relationship. I just forget that he exists. Right, um, right, if, right. If, if, Same <laughs> here. Yeah, I, I forget his name sometimes. I, I call him like a. I called him Bill one time, and I was like, where, where, like, where did I get that from? And it's just crazy. It, yeah, it's, uh, we, we've, we run a very weird relationship. Bill Copeland here. Bill um, Copeland, yes. <laughs> no, but yeah, it's been, it's been crazy. There's, there's been so much that's happened. Uh, I got a new car this week because one week ago today we had an, an awful, awful, awful hailstorm. My parents have lived here for 40 years, roughly. And they have never known a hailstorm in Texas like the one that we had. Um, it was it was crazy. At one point, you could look outside, and it looked because of the like the the piles of of hail and um, the 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 density of it that it looked like it snowed. It didn't look like it hailed. Um, it looked like it was a bunch of snow on the ground, and it was it was insane. Uh, and because we have a two car garage, and they each have a car. My car was kind of the sacrifice, and uh, they left it out on the, um, uh, you know, the driveway, and it got some damage. And so, because it's more than ten years old, Honda decided to total it out, and I got a new car, that's also really old because it's a 2008 Honda Civic. But um, in any case, yeah, it works. It runs a lot smoother. It's a little smaller than the mine Civics are no- notoriously small. Um, it's actually smaller than my even older car than I had before that one. Um, I'm, I'm a Honda person, so I've always had Hondas, but yeah, that was, that was crazy. It was, it was, a uh, it was an insane, it was an insane time. And so because of that, I didn't really have anywhere to drive, um, for about three days between, uh, last Sunday's work shift. And then I didn't work again until Thursday because of how it was scheduled. So because of that, it felt like a week and a half between the time, the times that I worked. So, I mean, just imagine that, and it's already also been, you know, two weeks since we recorded. So, yeah, it's it's felt like a long, long time. Um, I think that's the most notable thing I had happened. I mean, we we uh, scheduled our film festival. We'll give you all some details on that um, in a couple weeks, but um, right before we uh, we head out there. But it's uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Really excited. Uh, really good. Uh, like roster this year um 
maybe not quite as starry as last year's. There's no like first reformed level um, uh, acquisition for for their lineup, but it is it is very impressive, and I and I can't wait to see the movies that we've that we've chosen. Uh, Thirteen of them, so should be fun. And um, other than that, you know, just been kind of going through this Oscars project that I'm that I'm doing, and I'm almost done with 2005's Best Picture nominees. Uh, that's on my end, and uh, so that's that's been really fun. And um, yeah, other than that, just kind of seeing movies. I've seen Shazam already. That's going to be next week's review. Saw that on the 22nd or 3rd, whatever that Saturday was. And um, I saw Captive State. I'm not going to review it, but I'm just going to say that it's the worst movie so far this year. Uh, really boring. I I could not I could not stand that movie. I think that it would be really thoughtful if it was about anything, but it didn't really seem to be about anything. And um, yeah, that was a really that was a really uh, tough tough sit. Um, and then I saw the two movies that were that we're reviewing today. So um, that's been my that's been my couple of weeks. What about you, sir? Oh 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 boy. Um so. Yeah, it's been uh, been quite a journey the past uh, couple weeks for sure. Uh, as Joel mentioned at the top, <clears throat> this past week uh, we have nailed down all of our uh, films for the festival. As in, we got our tickets, we got our seats, so no one can take them. We got them all listed out. That's what we're going to be doing. But that's you know that's a few weeks from now. We'll reveal the list, um, you know, closer to time. But um, I was in California. I uh, went to my brother's wedding. Um, that was interesting. Uh, my girlfriend captured my best man speech on uh, on on camera on well on her phone, and so I'm sure Joel will get to witness that when he comes uh, to live with us during the festival. Um, it was quite funny. So uh, yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. Uh, I guess I got a sister in law now. Uh, cool. Um, so um, yeah, you know. Uh, but this is a movie podcast, so to rope it all around. To the actual uh, subject at hand, I did catch a couple of movies on the plane, and I finally watched If Beale Street Could Talk, which, by the way, it, th- this was super funny. I, I saw it on the plane, and I was like, oh, awesome. I get to watch it. Uh, I'm so excited. And once we get home, they put it on Hulu. And I was like, I could have <laughs> just waited uh, uh, another week but because uh, I, I wanted to see it um, on a bigger screen, better sound. But I had my uh, really nice noise-canceling headphones, so it wasn't too bad. Um, but if Bill Street could talk, it was an absolutely beautiful film. Uh, it would have made my top ten if I watched it in time. It, it was that good. Uh, I think Jenkins um, is two for two right now. He's just a really great uh, filmmaker. And then I watched Overlord on the way back. Um, I had fun with it. It was it was really. I love that whole opening sequence uh, when they're in the plane and it gets shot down. And it, yeah, it's it's really um, interesting green screen work. But it, it still was like this really thrilling sequence. Um, and it was just a really fun movie. I really enjoyed it. Um, and then what else did I watch? I watched the dirt, um, a couple days ago, the Netflix movie about Motley Crue. I honestly didn't care for it. It was whatever. Um, I think yeah, the, vo- what heard. Yeah, sure. the voiceover in that movie, it just, uh, just killed it for me. It just, it, it was just really corny. Um, Joel, do not watch it with your parents in the house. Um, that's all I'll <laughs> say. It is pretty, pretty raunchy. Um, yeah, and so I think that's it pretty much for um, movie-wise. Um, if you guys are into TV, uh, my girlfriend and I have watched um, uh, the first three episodes because, you know, they do it weekly on this one. Um, the Act, uh, which is the one with uh, Joey King and Patricia Arquette, and they play a mother-daughter combo where the mother is really paranoid about her health and, you know, she claims that, like, her daughter's, like, allergic to sugar and she can't really walk that much and like she does she can't have sunlight so she's one of those like really overprotective mothers that is putting her child at um like a health risk and you know it's just it's really great acting and i i patricia arquette's always like astounded me and whatever she does she always just kind of blends in like this really amazing chameleon and you're just like wow i can't believe that this is her right now but joey king is pretty phenomenal in the show so far um obviously have not finished it because we won't finish it for a few weeks because it's one episode a week but um a very good show um indeed so yeah that's kind of uh just what i've been doing just kind of catching up and then of course getting ready for the film festival but joel let's not waste any more time because you know that we're going to be long-winded talking about all the stuff that we missed now 
I don't know if it is because I had bad luck or I'm just terrible at timing or life just hates me, Joel. But every time when you go out of town or when I go out of town, that's when they drop the best trailers. <laughs> and it's like, are you kidding me? Like, we had to wait like two weeks to talk about these things. Now, I'm going to save um, uh, the Avengers Endgame and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood last. Um, so Joel, Joel and I can both um, discuss it. But I'm going to kind of just run through very briskly um, the ones that dropped while we were out. Now, I'm just going to start with the ones that were recent, like literally the ones that came out hours ago, and then just kind of work my way backwards. So the first one that actually dropped last night, um, and there's really not much to it, so I'm just going to kind of just alert you guys that it's, you know, it's existing, is the uh, third Annabelle movie, uh, Annabelle Comes Home. And now this one is the third film in the Annabelle franchise. I have not seen uh, the first one. I actually saw the second one, and I actually like Annabelle Creation. It was, uh, I, I think, pretty good when you compare it to stuff like The Nun. So um, this one's the third one. There's really not that much um, – plot to it they're kind of keeping everything under wraps but the second one was more of a prequel kind of going back in time to see where the annabelle doll was made this one is kind of going back to like the warren's house and really kind of really melding itself into the conjuring universe i mean it looks fine um i'm still gonna see it because warner brothers is doing the same exact thing that they did in 2017 where annabelle creation came out and they had that whole sewer clip from it uh, to play before the movie, it chapter two also comes out this year. So I have a feeling they're going to do the exact same marketing ploy, and it's just it's just genius. So um, I can't wait to see the new it clip in front of Annabelle comes home. But I'm not really looking forward uh, to the movie in general. It comes out June 28th, so it's going to be really kind of stacked uh, amongst all the competition that we have with the summer movies. So good luck to that. But the Warner Brothers horror films, especially within the Conjuring universe, do Isn't really that well. right after Child's Play. I think so. Wow. Yeah, because uh, cause Child's Play comes out the same week as Toy Story 4, which is probably yeah, irony to the most, uh, up most degree. But, um, yeah, that's... Oh. That's that's really weird that they would open it. For right. Open I, I think Warner Brothers' uh, marketing team either was just not aware or they're just like, no, we're going to take this movie down. It's like, okay. <laughs> um, good, good, good on that. So the next one is uh, a horror movie I am I am looking forward to. Um, it is not directed by Del Toro, but it is produced by him, and it's scary stories to tell in the dark. I'm sure Joel knows this. I know this. I'm sure anyone that you know was a kid in the 90s or even a teenager in the 90s, everyone is aware of this book. And going to the book fairs in school and seeing uh, scary stories to tell in the dark is one of the creepiest things you could find at the book fair, which is really funny because it's um, really disturbing ghost stories and they allowed children to buy it so uh, our school systems are uh, whacked out here in the u.s um so um yeah but the trailer was great it, it had like this kind of fantasy horror vibe kind of like what del toro does with like pan's labyrinth or you know even shape of water to some degree where you have all these like fantasy or fantastical creatures or you know demons or things lurking in the hallway and they look otherworldly but when you put them in kind of like this this uh, this rea- reality that we live in, it just uh, it makes it the more terrifying because of the otherworldly kind of uh, um, mystery behind them. You just don't know where they they're from, and you're just, you're freaked out even more. But the imagery looks really great. You know, the cinematography is uh, pretty great. It just it looks so great, just like a really nice uh, looking. Um, thing of nightmares you know uh, it's just uh i'm literally looking at the book right now on my shelf yeah exactly so um, Joel yeah knows it's what I'm talking about like we, it's a, we grew it's, up with this stuff yeah it's a masterpiece it, it's one of the most frightening books i've read right um each of the stories has some some element that's almost stephen king-esque almost um uh, it's it's yeah it's pretty crazy i haven't watched the trailer obviously but i'm right i'm excited it, it, for this movie. it comes out in august uh which hmm. is you know a Perfect, month before yeah. it chapter two, so it's going to be able to claim that whole month because I have a feeling this is going to be a huge hit. Yeah. Um, so it will claim that month, and it chapter two will dominate for three more months after that. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, scary stories to tell in the dark. Uh, very good trailer indeed. So the next trailer uh, to kind of go a little bit more somber uh, is the Tomorrow Man with uh, John Lithgow and uh, Blythe Danner, 
and this one tells the story of uh, Ed Hemsler as he spends his life preparing for a disaster that may never come, and then he meets um, uh, Ronnie, who spends her life shopping for things she may never use, and uh, they kind of meet up and they kind of fall in love. And so uh, we have, you know, two older people, uh, one of which kind of thinks in the more future presence uh, where, you know, he's just like, this is, disaster is going to come. I need to build this pump shelter. I need to stock up. And then we have this other person who lives in the moment. She buys things, may not even need them, but she just wants to live up life because they both know, um, given their age, that life is going to be very limited for them. They kind of meet, and you know, she teaches him to live in the present and stuff. I, it just looks really sweet. Um, it comes from Bleecker Street, so I'm hoping Joel and I get access to it at some point. Bleecker Street's pretty nice to us uh, over here, so um, yeah, it looks it looks sweet. It just looks like a really nice movie uh, about two people falling in love, and what what's more charming and delightful than that? Um, but it, it looks like. Um, uh, one of the best performances John Lithgow has given in the years because you know I, I haven't really seen him explode on screen like a movie screen in quite some time. But yes, I know he's a part of uh, the Crown and whatnot, but that's you know Netflix and everything. I'm sure everyone's great on that show. But if we're talking strictly movies, I'm not going to count Daddy's Home too. And so, you know, I kind of want to sweep that one under the rug and he's, hopefully he's a he's about to be in Pet Cemetery this next weekend. Right. Right. So, so he's gonna be, yeah, I'm but, excited for that. But yeah, once again, that's in the future still at this yeah, point. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just hoping that, you know, with like Pet Cemetery and Tomorrow Man, we can um, kind of get him back on track because he's a great actor. I was I was first exposed to him, um, obviously, as a kid, you know, voicing like uh, uh, Lord Farquaad. Um, in the first, uh, uh, Shrek. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, you know, and then when I was a teenager, I saw him as the, um, antagonist in season four of Dexter and he was, oh my God. If you want to talk about John Lithgow stripped down to like some scary stuff, uh, th- this is, that was the season of television for you. But yeah, tomorrow man looks fantastic. It's it just, uh, it's one of those ones that kind of flew under my radar and I was, uh, uh, now I'm uh, looking looking forward to. Uh, next one is the Angry Birds movie two. The first trailer finally released. <laughs> All right, moving on. Um, so, <laughs> listen, guys. It, it, I realize that some of our listeners, uh, including one that actually speaks to us um, through Facebook Messenger, I realize that some of you guys might might have kids, and this is probably going to hit them in a more profound way than it will ever hit Joel and myself. We're never going to review it. Um, if Joel wants to uh, cause suffering on his brain uh, brain cells, then he can do that, but I'm not going to do it. It just looks like more of the same, to be honest with you. Um, I did see the first one on a plane. It's honestly whatever. Uh, it's not as bad as I thought it was, but it's just like, why are we making movies out of a, a, a game app? It's bo- um, it's boring, and that's probably the really worst. boring, yeah. Yeah, it's probably the worst uh, offender and it's got a it, it had a really regressive message about anger, which right. I thought it, was it, it, it was kind of weird. Yeah, it was just really strange. I, I didn't really like. I didn't even like the concept. It was just like, cool. These random pigs come over, take over, and then they finally do the actual game in the last like ten minutes of the movie. It's like I, I don't understand what the point was, but it made a lot of money. So guess what? Sequel time. Um. So yes, uh, all of you uh, wonderful pe- people out there that have children, um. Uh, if that is you guys' thing, go for it. Um, you'll, your kid will probably like it. But if not, um, please show them stuff like Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse instead from Sony. So I will still continue to pimp that movie out uh, any day of the week. So the next one is a movie that uh, has been kind of in limbo for quite some time. It's from the director of Lion, which is uh, mm, one of those yeah. ones that Joel and I saw via um, screener through mail during award season. And this one is Mary Magdalene. This is the story of Mary Magdalene. Uh, if you guys are unaware, um, I, I, and I'm not going to sit here and like you know know who uh, she is through detail, like finite detail, because I'm not I'm not religious, and so but I'm very well aware of like the Jesus Christ and um, the Josephs and the Abrams and you know Mary Magdalene. I I know specific people, but I know. Um, 
Mary Magdalene was uh, first introduced to me <laughs> through the Da Vinci Code uh, with Tom Hanks. Uh, yes, I'm not even kidding. Um, <laughs> and so when I did further research, I was like, oh, okay, that, that's very interesting. And so this one you know, stars Rooney Mara um, as Mary, and then uh, Joaquin Phoenix plays uh, Jesus, and it actually looks really great. I, um, I am always uh, a person that's willing to try stuff. I never shut out a movie because it doesn't agree with my political views or, you know, even non-religious views. I, I don't do that. I will watch anything and give anything a shot. And I've liked some religious movies. I didn't mind that movie Risen with uh, Joseph Fiennes. Mm, yeah, uh, pretty good. Oh, yeah, that was, a, that was actually a good movie. Now, some of them, like uh, Son of God, did not like that one because <laughs> um, that was more of like a, a TV special with uh, – uh, worse effects and they crammed like two parts in the one. It, it was just, it was an edit editing mess um, that from a technical standpoint was just awful. Um, so there are some good and there are some bad, but, um, and those are just recent ones, by the way, I realize that they have been, been made for decades, but um, yeah, this one looks really great. It's very, uh, very kind of uh, nicely shot. Uh, the acting looks really strong. It actually has the same kind of color palette and feel to it as lion which is not a bad thing because I, I like that movie quite a bit. So, yeah, there's really nothing more to say. I don't really have any viewpoint on the subject matter or whatever, but in terms of the way it looks and the way the, these actors are placed in these situations, nothing really felt you know, out of the ordinary or whatever. It just it felt uh, pretty natural for the most part. So, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm all for it. Um, so for a movie that has been... I mean, it's because I, Joel, you remember like hearing about this like a year and a half ago, or maybe even two years ago. Yeah, like, yeah, it was supposed to be released by the Weinstein Company, which right, that, <laughs> yeah, that didn't happen. Right. I wonder for, why, for obvious reasons. So, yeah, um, you know what is really a really great Joel, even though I'm not religious, I will give any religious movie a shot, and I will gladly sit through hours upon hours of religious films, maybe even ones, um like God's Not Dead a million times rather than watch Dora and the Lost City of Gold. Um, so, I mean, th there's that for you. Uh, yeah, so that exists. That is a live-action telling of the TV show. Um, it looks weird. I'm not going to lie. We have a we have a actress playing Dora where I I'm just going to look her up real fast. Okay, so she was born in Isabella Moner. Right, right, so she was born in 2001, so she is – she's going to be 20 this year. She is playing someone that is acting like a 12-year-old and putting her in modern – it just – it reeks of like 90s, early 2000s Disney movie, but mm. I'm not going to say that's a good thing because I recently watched um, uh, like Max Keeble's big move the other day. I was like, oh, cool. One of those like you know Disney films that came out in two thousand two, two thousand three, and you know it kind of has like that that uh, kind of corny Disney movie feel, but I am still entertained by it. This just looks bad all around, <laughs> going from the animation to the actual concept to the actors and actresses that baffle me as to why they're involved. I just I don't like it. Once again, it is a family film, and I'm not saying Joel and I are against family films or animation. We will watch. Some, uh, like, for instance, earlier this year, it completely bombed at the box office, but, like, The Kid Who Would Be King, that was a great family film. And so, um, it's like when you have stuff like that that bombs, and then you have movies like this that's probably going to do well, it just makes me, like, cry inside. Um, and we haven't even seen Benicio Del Toro yet, because he's in this cast. Right, which and is then Danny Trejo voices Boots, amazing to me. The, the, the monkey. So oh, yeah. Oh, my yeah. God. <laughs> so, um that is going to be uh, interesting. But, yeah, I think just in terms of a trailer, everything about it just feels off. It really just feels like a factory-produced little movie to kind of just push out as fast as possible. No thought put behind it. Um, I'm not saying these filmmakers are, you know, don't care, but it's just one of those things to where I never really cared about the show. And then when you see it in live-action form, it just looks weird. Um, in a very off-putting way and not really wanting me to give it a shot. So um, Paramount, don't know what you're doing over there, but um, yeah, I don't want to see it. Um, okay, so the next one uh, is a trailer that was dropped by Netflix, and I've, I've heard about this movie for the past couple of years, you know, floating around 
Um, but we had never really seen the light of it. And believe it or not, when you make it big in Hollywood, um, a lot of them will want to go push your projects you've done in the past or smaller films and whatnot. And that is the case for Brie Larson. You know, she directed this little movie called Unicorn Store um, a long time ago, it seems like. And, you know, she's in it. Samuel Jackson's in it. And, of course, Captain Marvel going to reach a billion dollars here pretty soon. Now people are just like, okay, I'll, I'll buy whatever um, uh, passion projects you were w- working on two or three years ago. So that is what we have. And the first trailer was released. So we finally get to see what it looks like and the overall kind of vision that Brie Larson has because this is her directorial debut. And this one is about a woman named Kit who receives a mysterious invitation that would uh, fulfill her childhood dreams. And... In her childhood dream is to own a unicorn. And so, you know, she goes to various people to try to buy a unicorn. Samuel Jackson kind of steps in and goes, I can make that happen. And so it's very, um, um, it's not a movie that's like set in like any type of reality that we're, uh, you know, um, used to, but it still has themes that we can all kind of connect to, you know, growing up and still having that, you know, childhood part of you wanting to, um, fulfill in certain aspects and everything. So there are stuff, there are things that we can, um, totally grasp onto. Um, but in terms of the way it looks, the way it feels, to be honest with you, it's just kind of like, okay. Um, I I need to see the actual movie in terms of the actual trailer and the way it plays out. I wasn't a hundred percent sold on it. Uh, not to say it's not to say like the movie's gonna be bad or anything, but, um, because trust me, I've seen directorial debuts look way worse than this. But um, it's not really. I didn't really think it was like shot particularly like you know like extraordinary everything. It just looks like a pretty pretty standard looking movie. It's more. It's gonna be more about concept and uh, uh, the script and how uh, that kind of weaves in and out of the story. So you know, I, I'm willing to give it a shot. Uh, I think it. Uh, yeah. So it comes on uh, April fifth. Um, on Netflix, I'm sure Joel and I both will check out at some point. Hey, if we're bored during the film f- festival, we might, you know, play it or whatever. But yeah, I, I'm just not like a hundred percent on board, but I think everyone in the movie, um, w- you know, looks like they're really committed. You know, Brie Larson is one of the best working today. Um, and she's around Joel and I's age and it makes us wonder what we're doing with our lives. But, uh, <laughs> she, uh, is definitely moving her career in uh, the right places in terms of, you know, directing, acting, starring in the big stuff, the small stuff. You know, she's been acting for years, so um, I just think it's a it's a good move for her, and we'll, uh, we'll find out. All right, so the next one is Lucy in the Sky, and this might be my favorite trailer uh, in the past couple weeks, excluding the blockbusters and Quentin Tarantino's. This one kind of came out of nowhere, and I was really surprised. So this one is about a female astronaut who, returning to Earth from a life-changing mission in space, begins to slowly unravel and lose touch with reality, which is um, something that probably most astronauts go through. It's like going to um, going to war um, and coming back home and trying to adjust to society and realizing that um, there's you're just never going to be the same because you have experienced something. That is really kind of um, really kind of tough to comprehend as a human being. You know, um, when you go into space, it takes a lot on your body. It takes a lot on your mind. And uh, it, it's one of those things to where when you do that mission, you complete it. You come back to Earth. You're like, uh, wow, this, is, uh, th- this was a really great thing to do. But how do I adjust post-mission? Um, and that, that's always been really fascinating to me on how people adjust to society when they do something like that. And it looks like she's really um, – it's going to play a lot with her mind. Uh, it kind of reminds me of uh, – uh, oh God, Michelle Gondry um, in kind of like his visionary style um, in terms of that kind of like abstract surrealism of someone's mind and just how it kind of plays with them. It is directed by Noah Howley, and he is actually really prominent in TV, um, being a part of the Legion show, Fargo, Bones. Like he's got a pretty great resume, so I'm really kind of excited to see him take on um, this type of story. Natalie Portman plays the main uh, astronaut. Dan Stevens is in it. John Hamm, Zazie Beetz. It's a really great cast. So might be my favorite trailer, and it really kind of got me in the feels. 
and we only saw it for two, two and a half minutes. So good on them. Uh, the next one is Good Boys. Now, this one stars Jacob Tremblay. Um, oh, God, where's the other kid's name? Uh, Brady Noon and Keith L. Williams, and they play three um, sixth grade boys who ditch school and kind of go on this little journey, and they come across drugs, uh, probably hookers, uh, <laughs> and they curse a lot. You know, it's produced by Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg. It premiered at the South by South. West Film Festival um, as we were uh, on our hiatus and you know it, it kind of has like a super bad feel to it. it it has what Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg like to do with their kind of high school or middle school comedies um, I'm willing to give it a shot and it's not uh, uh, like a judgment on the entire movie but most of the jokes in the trailer did not make me laugh there were a couple times where I did kind of like smirk a little bit because I was like, okay, that was kind of, that kind of uh, caught me off guard. But, you know, I'm not one of these people. I'm I'm not a prude, but I'm not uh, also someone that likes when a movie just like, just says the F word a million times and not really have like uh, any kind of substance behind it. Uh, You know, I'm okay with stuff like Wolf of Wall Street or like Goodfellas that use it, uh, you know, when these people are, you know, kind of like they, they talk like that and like that's kind of like a part of their character or when you see something like a super bad it's like yeah i totally get that uh people in high school talk like that <laughs> and even people in middle school so you know these kids will talk like this but you know i i, I want it to I, I don't know how to like say it but like when you watch super bad the f-bombs are like sprinkled out uh in part humor in part you know uh, anger and frustration or just, you know, uh, kind of a part of the, I, I don't know how to like say it, but there was a flow to it. It wasn't just like just random placement of the word. So I, I wasn't really feeling the R rating to be honest with you in the trailer, but, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Cause I like Jacob Tremblay. I think he's a nice rising actor. Um, and, and you know, I, I'm a sucker for teenage comedies or, commies in general in school so i'm gonna see it just the trailer didn't fully win me over um the next one uh just very briefly we did get our full trailer for aladdin um we got everything (laughs) um we got what um aladdin's gonna look like jasmine what the city's gonna look like will smith uh when he's blue when he's not blue how um he interacts with people when he's in human form we got everything I'm still not sold on it. And I, I this is one of those things to where Disney made a huge mistake because they've done this twice in a row now. And I think they've done it three times. I just can't remember the third movie. But releasing a movie on Memorial Day weekend is one of the hardest things to do. And Disney has done it twice. Well, they've done it three times, but the two times I remember them doing it is Alice in Wonderland uh, through the Looking Glass and Pirates of the Caribbean 5. And both of those movies, while they did good respectively it still kind of slowed it down um and didn't make as much as their predecessors and releasing on memorial day weekend is a huge part of that most people are out uh that weekend you know going to the lake or hanging out with family grilling cooking out whatever a lot of people don't even go to the movies and so it's just so stupid to release it on memorial day weekend it's pretty much where Disney has started putting the movies where they don't really care how they do. Right. And they um, just release because it. they even put solo in this weekend. And I feel like that was, yeah, okay. That, that was the third one. I was, I was yeah. trying to think about, I was like, it just came or out that last one last year. That one legit lost some money. For, right. For and and you know, it, it's, I, I don't like using this word cause I don't think it really applies to anything. I think people just, um, don't watch enough movies. I, I do think, the word fatigue is appropriate because we have stuff like Dumbo. We have um, Lion King. We have uh, uh, Joel. What's the other one? I'm I'm forgetting the other live action. Um, or is that, the, is Lion, that it? The, the Lion King? Wait, oh, there's also Maleficent. Um, yeah, like Maleficent. Like so, Disney's yeah. pumping all these remakes out, and you know these reimaginings, live action, whatever you want to call them. But when you have all of them bunched up within a four-month period, people are going to get tired of them. And, you know, families can only go so many times to the movie. So if if I were a family and I looked at the three slated um, 
from you know Dumbo to Lion King, I would put Aladdin last. I'm just like ah, I'm good uh, type of deal. And so um, the trailer still has not won me over. Um, I do think, however, I think this is going to kill overseas. And here's why: the whole movie or the whole trailer um, kind of had a Bollywood feel to it, and that is a really popular genre. And so I would not be surprised if this movie was super successful in other countries. Um, you know, kind of like how like Aquaman hit with uh, with China super well. Uh, China really loves um, movies about um, like the water and that kind of like setting. So it's just really interesting how countries kind of um, – what they what, what they really kind of grasp onto, but I just I think it's going to really do well overseas. I I don't think it's going to do well here. I think it's going to get slaughtered by the summer competition. So uh, I mean, that's I mean just kinda... the week the week before that is Godzilla. Or no, that's week, that's the week after. Right. The week before the week before this one is because um, May is so weird this year. Uh, John Wick three, which I'm sure you're about to get to that, um, <laughs> but. Uh, John Wick three, and then uh, right after that's Godzilla, and then right after that is Dark Phoenix, and of course before all of these is Avengers Endgame, um, which is going to dominate for Quite at least a time. couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Pokemon isn't is also going to flop. You know, the there's there's definitely a handful of these that are coming out in the early summer months that. Are just that just can't that just can't hold up. I think that Annabelle Comes Home is going to be one of those just because of Child's Play coming right. out right before it. People are not really going to care um, about another doll movie right after their other doll movie. You know, it just that doesn't it doesn't track to me. And so yeah, you just have these these few movies that are probably just they're going to suffer. They're going to struggle. Um, they're going to make a lot of money, but they're not going to make enough money to justify themselves or. Um, be called successes in any specific way. And right. yeah, Aladdin, and, Aladdin is definitely one of those. I, I have a, I, I, I think Joel's correct. I think a lot of movies this, um, these summer months, there's going to be a lot of fatalities and, uh, we're just, it's going to be really interesting to kind of witness each week, um, what strikes with the audiences and what doesn't. Um, uh, yeah. So, uh, the next trailer or, or a couple more, and then we'll get into the ones that Joel has seen, uh, John Wick chapter three, I have nothing else to say. Gimme, 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 gimme. Um, there is your sound bite. Um, th- th- I love this franchise. I love it. And the th- this trailer is ridiculous, but it works for this universe. I love the world building that they they make with the John Wick franchise. I love the action sequences because they're done with actual like um, creativity and not it's not sloppy. It's stuff that we can see. They're not fast cuts. These um, you know, stunts go on for a long period of time with the on the same shot, and that's what makes it really kind of visceral and kind of like in your face type of action. But not only that, you have a character that we just love to see get in revenge. I mean, do not mess with John Wick's dog, and what you did was mess with his dog, and he's going to come after you. And it's a very simple story, but there's just it, it's just there's so much to it that just makes it so popular. And I, I love the second one. I think Chapter Two is actually better than the first one. Because uh, it expands on the mythology and the lore of this world, and really kind of ends on this. Um, I'm not going to say it's on the same level as like Infinity War cliffhanger, but it left on a pretty big cliffhanger to where I was like, "Oh wow, Chapter Three is going to be redonkulous." So, um, yeah, John with Chapter Three, please just give me now. Inject into my veins. I don't care what you do. Um, okay, in the last movie that we're going to talk about before I uh, kind of go over to the the two that Joel has seen is the film uh, directed by another directorial debut from Olivia Wilde. And this one is called Book Smart. And this one also premiered at South by Southwest. And this one is uh, about two girls in um, in high school. And on the eve of their high school graduations, uh, two academic superstars and best friends realize they should have worked less and played more. Um, and so that's, that's kind of it. It's basically two people that have put and buried their head into books all four years of high school, and they realized they never had fun. They never um, got around to socializing and really kind of uh, going wild, as the as the kids say. And it looks great. Like unlike 
Good Boys, where this one does, it is R-rated. There's cursing. There's you know sexual content. There's drugs. There's what high school, excuse me, what high schoolers do. It looks like it's really well written, with really great characters that we can all kind of see within ourselves. And uh, it's not it's not something to where like you know the message is all oh, they show have, like done drugs more and partied more. It's like I don't think people realize this, but when you go to school, when you go to a public school, it is great to have your academics up as high as they are, but it is also very important for social skills and to interact with classmates and, you know, to talk to people. That is a huge part of the real world. And having two, you know, two high schoolers realize that and realize that they need to kind of work on those skills is pretty awesome. And not only that, it's going to, it's going to have a lot of emotional baggage to it. It's going to have a lot of comedic stuff happening. It's going to be a really kind of well-rounded movie um, that's not just, you know, about partying. It's it's way more than that, and I, I I love it. And, you know, one of the one of the girls that is one of the leads, she's a co-lead, is uh, Bernie uh, Feldstein, who is, you know, Jonah Hill's sister. She was also in, um, you know, Lady Bird and all these other kind of smaller films kind of sprinkled throughout and uh, she she looks great in it. Like it looks like a really phenomenal movie. And I I'm not going to call it this early because we're we're literally only in April at this point. Like April's tomorrow, and so it's still early. If Joel sees this movie, I would not be surprised if it's a top five contender for like the rest of the year. And so um, I think Joel's going to really love it. I think a lot of people are going to really love it. I want to see it really bad. So. Between this and Lucy in the Sky might be my two favorites of the week uh, or the past two weeks um, that isn't a Tarantino uh, or in-game film. Um, so, yeah, Booksmart, definitely, definitely recommend uh, watching that trailer and um, uh, wanting to see it when it comes out. Okay, so let's talk about the two trailers that um, Joel has seen because he is um, he, he's going to break his rule on a few of them, and these are some of them. The Avengers in-game official trailer dropped. Just give it to me now. Um, it's just, once again, another great trailer to kind of get us ready for the end, um, literal end game. Um, and the one thing I really like about this marketing, it still hasn't shown us anything. I have no idea what's happening um, in terms of story progression. I know what's going to happen in the first five to ten minutes, but that's it. And that is exciting to me because Joel and I are going to... Um, what Joel's experiencing right now with like trailer... Uh, abstinence, if you will, is what we are going to experience with Endgame. All, everyone across the world is going to go into this movie not really knowing much, and we're just going to kind of let the story unfold, and I, that is so exciting for me. And then um, um, I, I love the chant that they have uh, playing throughout the trailer, um, whatever it takes. I just I love it. It just gets you amped up. Um, so, Joel, before we get into the Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, um First of all, do you think they're going to release? Because this is the hot rumor right now. Um, Joel and I do not do rumors because, or, or we don't put any like validation in rumors because we're not that type of uh, podcast. But there is, from the same sources that said that uh, Endgame will be three hours and two minutes, which is now true, the same sources are claiming that the tickets will go on sale for Endgame on April 2nd, which is a couple days from now. So do you think, Joel... They should release another trailer to um, say the tickets are on sale, or do you think they should don't do that and just announce on their Twitter and everything tickets are on sale and go? And, and also, what do you think of this trailer? Uh, maybe no trailer. Maybe what they could do is like the equivalent a TV spot of TV, or something. a TV spot. Yeah, uh, just online or whatever. Um, Thirty second, you know, forty five seconds, something. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I assume that that's when they're going on sale, um, and I'm certainly gonna buy my. I'm gonna have to see it the Friday it comes out, not the Thursday night, because of work. But can't wait, and the trailer is excellent. You're right. Um, it's amazing how much they have not shown because there's a lot of people like going through theories about you know hairstyles seem to be kind of the, the thing to talk about with this trailer, where in some of it, um, Black Widow has short blonde hair and in some of it she has long blonde hair dyed red um so there's clearly a time jump for that hair to have grown um although that's not technically 
true because I don't know some women and I don't know if Scarlett Johansson is one of them, but some women can grow their hair out pretty quickly. <laughs> you know, it, it just it just happens. Uh, so I don't know if that's super true. It could be that it's really only a couple months um, between it, whatever I'm trying to say. It, the theories are ab- abounding and and because of this trailer, but it's it's really excellently constructed. You're right. I have no idea what's going to happen. I mean. <laughs> The fact that this movie is three hours and two minutes it, it tells us that we don't know what's going to ha- going to happen because what they're showing us and what they're intentionally kind of you know they've they've even said it they're misleading us with this trailer, um, you know what they're selling to us is a movie that doesn't have a whole lot of plot like as is if you watch the trailers and trust them, then you're going into a movie that could be two hours or whatever, you know, something well, that's well, let me join like sort of like uh, deathly hallows part two, where it's significantly shorter than the other movies. Right. And you know, at least by 15 minutes or whatever. And so, um, but this one is, you know, full 40 minutes longer than the last one. So I, I think it's, I think it's really good marketing and an well, excellent, you know, trip. what's really fascinating is that if you want to combine it, because I, I would consider this actually like a, a one piece investment, if you combine the total cost of Infinity War and Endgame, I think that uh, cost Disney about – I think about a billion dollars just to shoot it. And so mm-hmm. I, I, the fact that they're not even pouring that much marketing marketing into either one of them because Infinity War was the same way is kind of shocking because it's the most expensive thing they've probably ever invested in movie-wise <laughs> and they're not really marketing it that much. And I just – I love that. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really smart, and uh, this is uh, this is definitely going to be an event. I, I can't wait. Um, and also, all the jokes about how Lord of the Rings fans are kind of sneering at the people who are like, "How am I going to make it through this?" Oh, right, yeah, because just like really, if really I can sit through a three and a half hour long movie, you'll be fine, children. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I'm actually excited. It's gonna be long, so I could care less if it's eight hours or thirty minutes. I'll still go see it. Um, all right, and the last trailer, because once again. Uh, when Joel and I are on hiatus, is always the best things drop. Um, is the first official teaser trailer, um, and I can't wait to actually see the uh, the real trailer. Um, but this is a great, great setup to Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Now, this is the ninth film from Quentin Tarantino, and this one stars Brad Pitt and Leonardo DiCaprio, and they are a duo um, where Leo is a actor and Brad Pitt is his stunt double, and. Um, that's basically it. Margot Robbie plays Sharon Tate. We have Bruce Lee in this one. Uh, not the actual Bruce Lee, but we have you know the person portraying Bruce Lee. I know. Oh. Right. It, which is, by the way, he was in literally one scene and he was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, but this one is, uh, once again, about a faded television actor and his stunt double as they strive to achieve fame and success in the film industry during the final years of Hollywood's golden age in 1969 Los Angeles. And believe it or not, that's all we know. We know it takes place around the Manson murders of Sharon Tate. We don't know much about uh, beyond that, but we got the official style. We got the way it's going to feel. And guess what? No shocker here. It feels like a Tarantino film. The dialogue is potent and kind of uh, really um, kind of just strikes you in the best way possible. I love the way Tarantino writes his characters. Um, and how they speak, and you know, Brad Pitt uh, saying Tarantino dialogue is fantastic. He's done it before with Bastards, and of course, you know, with um, DiCaprio doing it with Django Unchained. Like all these people have worked with Tarantino before, besides uh, Margot Robbie, which is great because then now she gets to be introduced into. Um, and also, we haven't seen him yet, but Al Pacino's in this. He hasn't right, worked Al Pacino, with Tarantino. And then uh, rest in peace. We have uh, Luke Perry's last um, oh yeah film performance too, so that will be interesting. Uh, isn't also a uh, uh, no because he 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 passed away right yeah yeah he shot. Uh, Burt Reynolds, Reynolds yeah, yeah yeah he was replaced by Bruce Dern uh, right which, right so uh, yeah so it's so it's so interesting that then you know I mean sad too that Luke Perry then passed because right. you know, now we have another actor who's involved with this movie kind of you know at some point Reynolds was obviously signed on a dotted line to play the role and yeah it's it's I, uh, I, I very think, sad. Uh, I think the family of Luke Perry and everything, you know, um, our thoughts go out to him. But I, I think yeah. it'll, I, I think um, this is a great way to go out. Like yeah, for Tarantino sure. is sure. like your yeah. last 
kind of film project is is pretty great. But in terms of the actual trailer, I loved it. We didn't get hardly anything, but I love um, the production design of it. It looks like old school, golden age Hollywood. Um, DiCaprio looks like he's on his game. Brad Pitt looks like he's on his game. Uh, listen, you're never going to find like a horrid performance under Tarantino. You might find some mediocre performances, but you're never going to find any horrid performances. Everyone looks on point. I can't wait for it. I want to see a real trailer now. Uh, thank you, Sony, for teasing us. Um, and also, uh, thank you, Sony, for picking up uh, the Tarantino mantle uh, after the whole Weinstein thing because – uh, Tarantino had uh, pretty much his contracts under them. And then once that scandal blew up, it was really kind of hard for for him to find a home for distribution. So I'm glad Sony stepped up and did that for him. So, uh, yeah, I, I can't wait for it. So, Joel, like, I know that you um, you like Tarantino films. And so, like, how does this one kind of strike to you? Does it have, like, a similar Tarantino feel as his other films? Does it feel different? Like, what was your thought process? Oh, for sure. And I like right now, pretty much in my head, whenever I think about this movie, I turn into that Stephen Colbert gif where he's saying, give it to me now (laughs) and grabbing at something with his hand. Um, I love this. I love this teaser. And I think that the final moments with DiCaprio in this trailer. Oh, right. The girl's just like, that's some of the best acting I've ever seen. He's like, oh, thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And then the name that, that he says, which is his own. Um, right. his own, his own character's <laughs> name with, I, I don't want to, I don't want to quote it cause it's got a, it's got an F word in there, but it's so funny. And I have a feeling, I, I just have this weird feeling that we're looking at another DiCaprio, uh, Oscar nomination. Right. Because man, there's some, we already are, we're already seeing really solid work from him and you know, Brad Pitt looks fun. It's called manslaughter. Um, <laughs> so, the, the, uh, appropriate term is manslaughter. Or however, yeah. he said it was so great. It's great, and I, <laughs> I I think it looks so it looks really fun I, in that in that Tarantino way. I I um yeah I can't wait to see how he works with Ro- Margot Robbie. I mean, she, that's perfect casting for Sharon Tate. I don't know how uh, they're going to incorporate uh, her to make to make Joel and I feel super old and super worthless in life. Margot Robbie is our age, and she's already worked with Scorsese and uh, Tarantino, and now I'm going to just go cry in a corner. Yeah, I mean, she's like two, two or three months younger than me. Right. I think yeah, only she's, about she's a month younger age, than me. So and, and then Brie Larson is a month older than me, so I, yeah. I just – what are we doing wrong? I, we're, we're I don't – doing anything with their lives, Joel. We're, we're recording yeah. podcasts in our rooms. I mean that, – <laughs> Literally in my doing. room right now. Right. Um, oh, boy. Anyway, I'm going to start like – Having, I'm, I'm going to start doing a YouTube series of four-hour rants about <laughs> comic book movies, uh, uh, and then try to hey, make you'll money. Blend in. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> join the join the crowds. Um, no, I, I love this trailer, and it's and it's and it's fantastic. So, so. I, I have I have one more question to ask you, and then we'll get into the the news. Do you think uh, because typically Tarantino films usually come out around Oscar season, this is one of the first ones in a while where it's going to be smack dab in the middle of summer. So, do you think this is a good a good ploy for Sony to be that confident and be like, Hey, we're going to put this Tarantino movie in July amongst all these other big blockbusters. Do you think it's like great counter programming? Do you think it's stupid? Like what, what do you think? I can't remember how Inglorious bastards did. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know how successful it was, but it came out in August and it came out right after a bunch of stuff did. So I don't know. I mean, I think that that's probably the best, you know, comparison. It is the end of July, not the end of August this time. Oh, but excuse me. Um, but still, it's just it's it is interesting that it is coming out right in the middle of summer like that. Um, if bastards is, if bastards did fine, then I think that this will. Um, I, I certainly know, with I star the, power. Like, well, like Django did phenomenal, and so did the Hateful Eight because they both came out around December. So yeah, but. Yeah, but the, not every December is equal. I mean, uh, I guess that's well, that's that's probably not a good argument because um uh Hateful Eight came out like a week after Star Wars. So True. I I think that I think that it did fine though. Uh, but the difference was that it wasn't just immediately released in December. It had the um Yeah, it was a slow the, rollout. Yeah, it was a slow rollout with all the the big, you know, um Roadshow edition and all of that, and it and it rolled out over the course of a couple of weeks, and finally came to what. So I I don't know if that's a great comparison. Um, Django is probably the better one, and I think it did pretty well. Um, yeah, I think it made 
I think it was one of the highest. Uh, yeah, I think it's the second highest or something. We- for him. Weinstein, well, highest grossing for Tarantino for sure, but one of the highest grossing for Weinstein Company before it went under because it made like almost like like four hundred, five hundred million worldwide, which is insane for a Tarantino film. Yeah, yeah, especially of that length. Yeah, it was two hours um, and forty something minutes. It was crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, so it'll be interesting to see where this goes. It'll be interesting to see how long this movie is, right? Um, because he's been—it seems like he's been getting longer and longer. So uh, I mean, just do you think because Sony is a bigger company than Weinstein, do you think they're going to give more restrictions on that, or do you think they're like, hey, this is Tarantino, he has established himself, we're going to let him do his own thing, and he can make whatever length he wants? I mean, there's probably always going to be at least a little bit. Right. Uh, but I, I doubt it. I doubt that there's going to be a lot. I, I feel like this is probably one of their, the instances of Sony being smart about something, which doesn't come <laughs> very often. Today. But it's it's. Uh, I think that I think that that's it's a smart it's a smart decision. So we'll we'll see we'll see what happens. Uh, I mean I know that it also comes out right before Hobbs and Shaw, and it comes out right after. Um, I guess it's the Lion King, right? Yes. So yes, yeah, the week after. So we'll see what happens. I mean, they're not even similar audiences, so. But I you mean, never like know. that. That's great though, crowd, because I, 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 you have uh, Lion King, which will probably be G or PG. You have Hobbs and Shaw, which will be PG thirteen, and you'll have uh, Hollywood, which is r- going to be rated R. So it's going to be like everyone will have a movie to go see, type of deal. Yeah, pretty you much. Know. All right, so we're going to move on to the news, and guys, <clears throat> there was so much that happened. Um, oh my God. <laughs> and so here's much. and here's the problem. So before we started recording, I told I told Chase that we're going to skip one bit of news, but Chase, on air, I'm just throwing, I'm just kind of flipping your world around a little bit. The thing that we were going to skip is the only thing we're going to talk about. Um, okay. Because everything else, I can just move off to the to next week. This guys, is the guys, problem of here's the here's the deal. If if this is Joel's section, he can do whatever he wants. So if he wants to report the news naked in a bathroom somewhere, I don't care because this is this is his section. If he wants to switch it up, ax it. He wants to have it five hours long. Is whatever Joel wants to do. So even if he flips these things like the last second. I appreciate it because it keeps me on my toes. But Joel, this is this is yours, man. You can you can yeah. do whatever you please. Okay, so there's been a there was like 78 items of casting. We'll just <laughs> talk about that next week, and then one broke like in the last 12 hours or 24 hours, whatever. So we'll just add that on. Talk about all of that next week. There's, um, you know, there's a couple there's a couple things there. I, I'll just I'll just talk about it all next week because, guys, while we were gone on the on March 20th. The Disney Fox merger went through, and so I just want to kind of ask Chase, um, what do you think this means for the studio system? And by that I mean not just Disney and Fox, but everybody else, Paramount, Sony, etc. Also, are you feeling like I'm feeling that basically Disney Plus – it's kind of Disney's future, and I'm going to make a bold prediction here, and I'm wondering if you think that I'm insane. Um, I'm going to make the prediction that the 2020s are going to be the last decade of Disney releasing anything theatrically if Disney Plus takes off. Um, do you think I'm insane to suggest that? And I'm also going to give the reason why. So here's the thing. There's going to be a lot of people who are basically forced to sign up for Disney+. Plus. And I mean that literally because Kevin Feige was doing an interview at some point. Was it an interview? It was either an interview or – I think it was an interview. Um, I, I can't remember if it, was, if it was a question he was answering or something he was just saying in a – in, in some sort of other fashion, but he was saying that basically all of the Disney Plus MCU shows and the movies that are going to be made in the next decade are going to be connected together. So characters from the movies are going to be showing up in the shows. Characters from the shows are going to show up in the movies. Plot lines from the shows are going to incorporate are going to be incorporated into the movies. Plot lines from the movies are going to be incorporated into the shows. 
So basically, here's my thought. They've they've pretty much done a terrific runaround of basically telling people you need to sign up for this if you want to keep up with the storyline of the MCU from now on. And people are so invested that, yes, I think that, first of all, Phase 4 is going to be just as big as everything else before it. And two, people are just going to be forced to say, okay, well, I'll just sign up for Disney+. Plus. And considering the fact that it's going to be, you know, you sign up on levels, kind of on pricing levels is what I've been hearing about it. Um, I think at the lowest you get just all of their uh, all of their programming that they've ever done, all the movies and shows and stuff that they're adding. And then probably on a higher level you get the, uh, the programming. And I think it's two-tiered, so that would make sense. And then you also have stuff like the Star Wars show, uh, The Mandalorian, probably some other shows. Um, you know, so you're going to have this, like the Loki television show, you're going to have the, um, uh, I think that there's, there's a couple other things they have in the works, but I forgot what they were. Um, and so I feel like what basically they've done is they've, they've, they've kind of put this out there and said, you know, people, if you want to enjoy Disney stuff from now on, you've got to, you've got to sign up for Disney plus because, where else are gonna are people gonna see all these movies that have been lost for for decades, that they all that they always have had access to just in the vault and they're coming out of the vault. Where are you gonna watch those? You're gonna watch those at Disney Plus. Where are you gonna watch the MCU shows that they're probably never gonna release on physical copy? You're gonna watch it on Disney Plus. Where are you gonna keep up with the MCU? You're gonna keep up with it on on Disney Plus. I have a feeling that Disney Plus is basically the future of Disney Entertainment. So. What does that mean for the studio system? Does that mean that they're going to go back to kind of these mid '90s programmers and 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 um, and all of that, the mid budget thrillers that made so much money, like Fugitive and Speed or something? Um, because we're not going to have Disney in theaters anymore, and so we're not going to have this this thing that people have kind of been pointing out the um, uh, what's the word uh, the uh, kind of overabundance. People have, people have called it overabundance, including me at some point, uh, of superhero movies that have just kind of pushed off everything else onto onto VOD. Are, are studios going to return to those in the absence of these huge, you know, franchises, or are they just going to turn to franchises knowing that it worked for Disney? And does it mean that eventually everything is going to be streaming? Because I think that I personally think that. If Disney's going this way, it's probably not going to be super long until other places go this way. And so, you know, they shut down Fox 2000, which was their indie outlet. Um, that's the that's the company that distributed um, The Hate You Give last year and uh, several other things. It was a pretty big company. It, it had a lot of uh, women directors and uh, directors of color attached to projects. Kind of... Uh, Kind of bad, although it was predictable to me because, you know, whenever Disney takes over something, they usually kind of – I was looking into this. They usually shut down a lot of really important, like, offset uh, offsets of companies whenever they take them over and then just kind of turn them into something else. So, you know, is Fox 2000 going to kind of become something else? Um, you know, I, I just – it's really interesting to see how this has kind of taken a turn just in the last week or so since it was announced. And I have to I have to ask Chase, am I crazy to think that eventually Disney's just not going to send anything to theaters? I don't think you're crazy. Now, I will agree with you, but here's my only my only caveat as to why I don't think they're going to fully do it, but you know, maybe I'll talk myself out of it. I do think you're correct because when you put a movie in theaters, um, there is a certain cut that theaters get. It's not much, but there is a cut that dips into the numbers of uh, you know the opening weekends and whatnot. I have a feeling that Joel is correct because if you put everything on Disney+, Plus, if you force um, movies from the vault to go on Disney+, Plus, you fo- force all these like new shows – that will never see the light of day on Freeform or ABC or whatever else uh, D- Disney owns. It's going to go on Disney+. Plus. They're going to force you to buy it. Now, if they put everything on a streaming site, 
Now, I'm, I'm not like a business expert, but I'm not an idiot either. So I do know that unless they actually build everything from scratch and they host on their actual company, they still might have to pay like a, a hosting fee or very small, minute fees um, to run their subscription service. But for the most part, I'm going to say like 95% of the profits they get monthly will go straight to their pockets because it's their site. They won't um, you know, release it to anyone else in terms of rights or whatever. Like it's, it's all them minus like some small stuff that they have to probably pay for or, or whatever. But that's still a better margin than theaters because when you release something, you know, for every $10 ticket sold, you know, theaters might get one or two of those dollars. This is a business, folks, and do you think Iger is going to really sit around and go, oh, wow, we, yeah, we can still release in theaters, but we can get a lot of our profits from the subscription service, and if we make it you know, like 30 bucks a person, 40 bucks a person, like we can do pretty well. And um, believe it or not, even if and, – and this is a, a, a thing people have to realize is that when you apply to like Netflix or Hulu or even HBO – They get your money each month, no matter what. So if you sit there dry and you do not watch any content, Netflix, Hulu, or HBO, they take your your monthly um, payment and move on. And most of us pay around $100, $120 for these subscription services yearly. That's how much it is if you add everything up each month. And so say they jack it up to like $30. You know, Netflix right now in some states is running about 15 a month. Can you imagine if you paid a little over $200 a year per person for a Disney Plus site? If you have a person, because Joel and I are not normal, as you guys know, like we see uh, a million movies a year and this is why we have no friends. But for the (laughs) most of you, you guys see maybe three movies a year. Most of it's probably Disney. Say... Say you go to uh, you know Avengers Endgame, Lion King, and Frozen 2. You're going to pay anywhere from like 30, 40 bucks total for the entire year that you go see movies. Those movies are going to still make a lot of money regardless if you go to see them, but you're paying about 30, 40 bucks. Can you imagine if you gave Disney $200 a year on a Disney Plus site even if you don't see everything? You're giving them more money than you would go see the theaters. And if you don't think that's not what they're discussing behind closed doors, then I can't help you. Like I said, I'm no business expert, but I don't think that's too crazy of a theory that they could just put everything on Disney Plus and um, charge about 30 bucks a pop. Um, also, on a uh, logistics side for families, that's genius. Do you really think? parents that have a two-year-old and like a newborn and do you really think they want to go drag their family out in public into the theater it's, it's a hassle and it's expensive if you can just charge 30 bucks for that you cater to people staying at home and once again they get most of those profits and it's just like that makes total sense to me however this is the only caveat i can see of what joel's proposing not really working um, only because of this. Um, if you release anything in theaters nowadays, uh, a lot of you know news outlets or entertainment pundits, they will release an article that you know, like Captain Marvel opens to a hundred and thirty million uh, on its opening weekend. I mean, that's a pretty good headline. It's pretty good marketing. And so that would be my only hesitation is that I think Disney would miss the kind of like boastfulness of their their films when they strike gold on opening weekends and really kind of dominating the headlines because that does kind of propel movies um, even further and that's free marketing. So I don't know. Um, It could go either way, but I'm not going to say your theory is completely crazy. It's actually pretty viable and – I'm not giving like all the facts. I mean, I'm just kind of um, if I, if I was a Disney head and I was in a business meeting, that's kind of all the stuff uh, I just told you guys. That's probably what I would discuss with fellow business executives. So 
I, I don't know, man. It's going to be uh, interesting to see um, how that goes. Uh, now, the bigger question is who's going to pay for it? Because um, right now I pay about $45 for all of my um, subscriptions, whether it be HBO, Hulu, or Netflix. Um, and I know people out there have more than me with like Prime or even like CBS All Access or, you know, the DC uh, Universe thing. It's just like, it's just getting crazy now. But believe it or not, if you charge 30, 40 bucks and you give a lot of content on Disney Plus, I can I can bet you money right now a lot of families will jump on that no hesitation. It's mainly getting us like Joel and I who are um, kidless right now and like you know already have a bunch of subscription services. That's who they're trying to push it towards, and that's why I, they they do shows like The Mandalorian or these um, the Loki and Scarlet Witch show. It's like now I'm tempted to buy it now because of that. And so I don't know, man. It's really dangerous. Um, it, I'm not one of these people that thinks this merger is a good idea at all. I really don't, um, but it's one of those things to where we can't we can't change it. It's going to happen, and the swallowing up of other studios is what really does scare me. Because now that they own Fox and all this property now, um, I think their overall uh, box office intake for the entertainment industry is uh, Joel. Was it like forty percent now or something like that? Yeah. So something. it's. That's really bad, and it's going to get to a point where they're going to crush everyone else, and whoever is going to file for bankruptcy next, Disney's going to sweep in and buy them, and it's just going to be a <laughs> swallowing up, and I don't I don't like that. Um, I know a lot of people are you know, hooting and hollering for the X-Men and Fantastic Four to join the MCU, and that's why they're only excited for this merger. I mean, I'm as excited as the next person, but if you want to think about the reality – and the business behind it, it's it's still dirty, and I still don't like it. Um, so I, overall, this merger, I, I still don't support. Um, but I think Joel's correct. I think Disney Plus is their their future, and they will release everything on there. And if if their ego is as big as I think it is, they will do the opposite of what Netflix does, and every single weekend releasing these big tentpole movies on the site or the streaming service, they're going to release the numbers, and they're going to be like. This is how many millions of people streamed it in the first 72 hours. And it's like, that's once again, well, I guess that would get behind the whole um, box office headline thing. So maybe, see, once again, I, I talk myself out of it. So maybe that's how they get around it. So see, here's, here's, I think it's going to be one of two things that happens. One, by 2030, there's going to be a major paradigm shift and we're not going to see any Disney in theaters. Or by 2030, uh, maybe even earlier than that, what they're going to start doing is maybe releasing movies w- for like one month in theaters. Um, you know, the big, the big, big movies. And then they're going to keep some of their movies for the streaming service only. And then maybe these big tentpole Marvel or Star Wars movies, they're going to release for a month and then put on the streaming service with no physical copies. That's, that's the thing that I fear. I'm pro physical media. I think that we need to start steering the uh, the economy back into a place where people can start like affording to um, collect these again. <laughs> because it's, kind of hard, that's the it's kind of hard to do that when they charge the platinum version of Dumbo forty dollars, and it's like yeah. Disney, come on, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and it's it's crazy, but it it I think that I think that it needs to happen at some point. We need to we need to or collectively somebody needs to start figuring something out to make that viable again because streaming is just so much more appealing to people who can't afford to buy movies every week. Right. Um, you know, they're instead they're buying monthly subscriptions and you know, that's why, um, you know, that's partly why I love the AMC a list. It's slightly different situation, but you know, I'm not having to pay for tickets every week. I'm just paying $20 a month and, uh, or 22, $22 a month. I think it went up slightly, but, um, $22 $22 a month and then I can see three movies a week for free. So, you know, it's, it's basically, I'm seeing, you know, 12 movies a month for $22, you know, so it's, it's a, it's a lot more appealing than having to go into a movie and pay $20 for a ticket and, and food right. every single time you go. Um, so that's, so I think of course the economy is a problem. That's always at the issue at the center of everything. But yeah, um, that's what I fear is that eventually kind of physical media is going to just be pooped out and it's not, 
it's no longer going to be a thing, at least for Disney. And once that happens, I mean, you know, I don't know what happens to their other movies that are that are on physical media. Um, if their market value goes up, if they start pulling them off of vendors and all of that. It's it's going to take a hit. And uh, I mean, just the simple act of uh, you know, this is unrelated, but um, pulling pulling physical media off of shelves has has a consequence. Because recently, because of leaving Neverland airing, and I'm sorry to bring it up again, commenter that told us not to, um, but uh, because of leave, leaving Neverland airing, the Simpson, the Fox decided to pull the Simpsons episode um, with Michael Jackson, and because of that, it's it went way up online. So now right. we at, at work, I don't even, you can go in and verify this with somebody at wherever the closest store is to you, Chase. Um, we sell seasons two and four for nine ninety nine, used. That's the used price. And now because of recently, we now sell season three used for forty nine ninety nine because of the fact that it went way up in market value. Joe, and don't you just love supply and demand? It's so great. Exactly. We, I, I love it's, the capitalist society we live in. <laughs> it's, it's so annoying. And so anyway, it's it's so it's so crazy. And it and it's just it's just it's it's intense. Um all right, so um, that's the news item that I wanted to cover, and that was twenty something minutes. So that was a good plan too, because I, you know, Chase and I have lives. Uh, we're not going to lie to you guys. We we got lives, so we're going to go ahead and move on, considering we have two reviews to cover. Right, and, and I will and just of course all of our all of our wonderful listeners have lives too. Everyone's on the move, Joel. Well, like we yes. just have to we just have to keep going. <laughs> Exactly. So I'm going to go ahead and review Dumbo real quick, uh, and this is this is fairly quick. So this, of course, is Tim Burton's uh, remake or reimagining, whatever, live action wise, of the 1941 film, um, which is one of the shortest of Disney's uh, golden era and or golden age, however you say it. Um, and this is definitely an expansion on the story. So Colin Farrell stars as Holt Ferrier a war veteran um, who's come back from the Great War with one arm and two kids to take care of after the death of their mother. Um, the kids are kind of wards of a circus, traveling circus, uh, led by the Master of Ceremonies, Max Medici, played by Danny DeVito, and um, kind of keeping time with with Holt's return to his family. Uh, an elephant is born among the uh, the kind of the troop of animals that Medici has bought over time. And because of its big ears, Dumbo, as it's called, uh, becomes kind of popular for the fact that it can fly. Um, or basically, as, as, uh, as Woody, I guess, would say, uh, falling with style. Kind of, kind of hovering with style, if you will. It doesn't really fly so much, but it does, it does keep, keep some air time. And it becomes kind of a minor sensation, drawing the attention of a wealthy um, amusement park a music amusement park mogul, played by Michael Keaton. Um, guys, all right. So I like the original Dumbo. I rewatched it right before, about a week before I saw this new one, and it's good. It's it's a it's a lovely little movie. It's very short. It's barely even a movie, and I don't mean that as a as a as a criticism. I think it's more of an observation, if anything. Basically, it, it, it kind of – what it does is it utilizes imagery and this sort of experimental kind of uh, feel to it that um, it basically focuses on your experience with the different sensual and uh, aesthetic uh, properties of itself. It's, it's not really telling so much of a story. It has a premise, and that's about it. And – that works in its favor because it's a really interesting experience and it's a good movie. It's quite lovely. There's a big heart to it and I like it. This new one forgets about Dumbo in the process and that's the problem with it. Um, so it kind of straddles Dumbo as, as a supporting character in this really dull human story. Um, eventually the, the mogul named, um, VA Vanderveer, uh, becomes kind of a predictable human con uh, human antagonist uh, for the other human characters to kind of battle against Dumbo just becomes a prop for everybody including you know most most ex um, extensively him the, the the mogul but 
also just of the screenwriter, uh, Aaron Kruger, who, you know, his work on the Transformers movie is kind of shining through here. Um, it, it's basically a movie about its own spectacle. It's not even really about the heart, the, the, the character at the heart of this story, which is Dumbo. Um, and that's, that's a big problem. I mean, you know, being Tim Burton, it does look amazing. It's, uh, it's got cinematography by Ben Davis, who's worked a lot on the MCU. Um, it's got, you know, the score by Danny Elfman's rather lovely it, it, when he uses the, uh, like bars and, 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 um, notes from a lot of the songs on the original film soundtrack. Um, you know, there's, there's one definite, um, improvement in one moment though. So the original film's kind of controversial for a couple of crows that come into the story that are basically like stereotyped black people, um, or they're modeled after them. And so the, and they're, and they're given a song, the, the song that everybody knows when an elephant, or when I, when I see an elephant fly, um, which instead of doing that, what they do is basically just incorporate the words of the chorus into an introductory speech given, um, by a ring, a, a, a ringmaster. So that's, that's a cool little change. And I think that some of these modernizations are, you know, they, they have value. And I, and I, and I think that that's one of them, obviously the visual effects to bring Dumbo to life are, are really impressive because they, they somehow given him, give him a personality in the same way that like uh, Caesar is given a personality in the planet of the apes reboots. So there's a couple of things that obviously, you know, improve on the, original whether aesthetically or um or conceptually like the the song uh but for the most part though the original movie's kind of innocence is replaced by this story of basically dumbo suffering a bunch that's that's pretty much it the entire story hinges upon him suffering uh time after time after time and it doesn't really work it's it's just it's it's just kind of ultimately kind of empty and um but beautiful, and that's pretty much what you can say of of any Tim Burton movie, at least for me, from the last like the last decade. I don't think he's made a good movie since Sweeney Todd, um, and that includes Frankenweenie. I know a lot of people like that movie, but I do not. I think it suffers from the same problems as most of his other movies. Lots of really empty spectacle. Not not a whole lot that the movie is trying to do to say what it's saying. Um, he's clearly a movie a, a movie director who works with plots about outcasts and that's why he was attracted to Dumbo. But yeah, it, it just doesn't really work. And, um, you know, it kind of suffers from a lot of the same problems as Miss Peregrine's home for peculiar children back in 2016, which is a movie also about, um, outcasts. And so clearly a Tim Burton movie, but without any real personality, um, there's none of the sense of Gothic inspiration that kind of led, you know, even, you know, semi-family entertainments like Big Fish, which is my favorite Tim Burton movie. Um, this one struggles, and I think that it's a big disappointment. I was excited for this movie. I, I thought that it looked quite good. Um, the the trailers certainly sold it well, but yeah, it 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 ultimately just ends up being kind of an empty an empty you know whatever a, a really pretty kind of like a really pretty case that holds nothing um i don't think this movie's really saying anything and that's a that's a that's a shame so i'm giving dumbo a c minus um unfortunately and you know it's not awful you could probably do worse but you could definitely do better just watch the original again that's that's my that's my advice it, it still exists it's still out there just watch that one again um so yeah um that is dumbo and uh, I know that Chase is now going to run out to see it. It's, uh, yeah, number one on his priority list, right? Uh, no, I have to mow the lawn today. I think that's more important. <laughs> um, all right. So that's Dumbo. And now we are going to review Jordan Peele's Us. Now, okay, <laughs> guys, uh, just kind of, you know, lead into into the review with a bit of a disclaimer we're not going to be able to cover everything about this movie. Um, this movie is a dense piece of work. There's a bunch going on and a lot that we could talk about in the third act in like a spoiler section, which we don't have time for. Um, I know that it's two weeks later. Y'all were probably expecting a huge three and a half hour show, 
we can't provide that uh, sometimes. <laughs> Unfortunately, today is one of those days. It would probably be better if we could just because this movie, again, there's so much going on. Um, so I'm just going to kind of give the basics of the plot up to a certain point, And then I'll hand it over to Chase for his review. And then I'll give mine. Um, all right. So this one stars Lupita Nyong'o and Winston Duke as a married couple with children um, played by Shahadi, Joseph, uh, Shahadi Wright Joseph and Evan Alex. They are arriving at their summer house, uh, which has also uh, previously been her, the mother's childhood home. Um, the mother is named uh, Adelaide. And this house rests about maybe 10 miles from a beach where uh, Adelaide had a very, very frightening experience as a child. Um, she was wandering through a state fair. She ended up in a, um, in a hall of mirrors and discovered that she has a doppelganger. And this doppelganger has haunted her for the rest of her life. She's always felt that it's going to come back. And indeed, it does. One night, they are terrorized by uh, a family. And the thing is that the family looks exactly like them. Um, they are copies or doubles or shadows or something very, 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 very troubling. And um, that is pretty much all I'm going to say because this is quite a heady head trip of a movie. Um, Chase, go ahead, sir, and good luck. Okay, so as Joel said, we're not going to do spoilers, but um, you know it's very easy to slip into the spoilers. So I'm going to try to be as vague as possible and really just talking more about more about the um, the overall story, as what Joel mentioned with the whole doppelganger thing, and then of course the technical aspects. So you know, back in uh, 2017, we had no idea what to expect. I mean, Jordan Peele was always. Um, a great comedian. Um, my girlfriend and I are watching Key and Peel right now. And the fact uh, that we got into episode three and Jordan uh, in the show stated his love for horror films and even talked about his favorite film being The Candyman, which is funny because now he's producing the remake. It's just it's so cool to see um, um, kind of time capsule Jordan talk about horror. And we had no idea that he was going to be this sensation now. So, you know, when Get Out came out, we had no idea what to expect. It was his first um, movie behind the lens like that. We're like, all right, we'll give it a shot. And guess what? It's an Oscar-winning movie. And it was nominated for a lot of uh, different awards, which is really great for um, you know horror films in general because typically they're not uh, nominated as much. Now, for all, uh, before uh, I begin, this film is nothing like Get Out. So please stop comparing it to Get Out. Um, it, they are actually different genres entirely. Um, Get Out is more of a horror thriller, and this is more of a science fiction horror. So please, please, please stop comparing Get Out uh, to this movie or even bringing it up. You can bring it up if you want to talk about like Jordan Peele's filmography before you get into this, which is what I did, and then move on. So um, with that being said, so us, you know, given the, the trailer that came out you know, three months before this movie came out, because it came out on Christmas Day. It was one of those things where Blumhouse was like, hey, you guys didn't get uh, enough love on Christmas, so we're going to give you something to kind of hold you over. And, you know, we knew that Jordan Peele was going to have a follow-up uh, to his filmography and uh, have his sophomoric debut, um, but we had no idea what it was really about. We just knew it was called Us, and we saw the poster for it, and we're like, where's the trailer for this thing? They're really kind of keeping it hidden. It was a huge sensation on uh, Christmas Day. I remember uh, texting Joel about it on Christmas Day. It's like, I can't believe this was released. And, you know, it was um, really fun. Because I, I went to his house to record all three of those big podcasts that you guys um, got at the end of the year. And we talked about the Us trailer for a good while because it was, you know, a hot topic for conversation. But it blew me away. I was like, I have no idea what this movie's about. And I love going into movies, um, having that feeling and just knowing that watching a trailer that piqued my interest just from the visual language to the mystery of the story, I was like, I'm in. Just please give it to me. Um, so I saw it uh, a while back 
and I've had time to think on it because I already know Joel's great on it. I already know his thoughts on it. And I, I told him my um, kind of initial thoughts on it. But after it has simmered uh, for quite some time, I love it. And it kind of reminds me of uh, like a like a Twilight Zone episode. And even to go as far as picturing the whole movie in black and white as if it was like some um, episode that Rod Sterling was introducing. It kind of has that vibe and also kind of reminds me of the flavor of, um, you know, the movies of like the 50s and 60s horror films of like, you know, the the thing from outer space or whatever, like that type of not like um, uh, cheesiness, but it kind of has like that old school type of flavor to where if this movie came out like decades uh, earlier, I think it would definitely freak people out. Uh, and it's doing that again now and um this era, but um, it still has that kind of like old school mentality, which I absolutely uh, love. Um, before I get into my review, I will say that uh, I will never ever listen to "I Got Five on it the same way again. And the the haunting orchestral techno version of it um, is just absolutely spine chilling. And uh, thank you for that, uh, composer. Um, so actually, I'm going to start off at the top. The music is phenomenal. Um, it's one of those horror scores that, um, not only is smart with what it's doing, but also, um, just kind of elevates each scene that's kind of accompanying and just really kind of brings up the, the tension and the, the frightening levels to like an 11 out of 10. Um, even when they're on the beach and they're just kind of walking around, you have this like swelling of, um, tension filled orchestral music that's just super loud but it 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 makes sense for the the atmosphere of the film and it's just it adds so much dimension to this movie and even the opening with the credits and every single piece of music is different in this movie but it works all uh simultaneously with one another it's even down to a point where and this is in the trailer this isn't spoiling anything but like when they're in the car and they're listening to i got five on it it's a really great song um if you guys haven't listened to it really great kind of a hip-hop beep that you know you can easily uh, kind of bob your head to, or even in Lupita's case in the movie, you know, kind of snap your fingers to. Um, you know, that even has a purpose because it ties into the end of the movie, where you know when you listen to "I Got Five on it, it's a very like um, it's a very loose hip hop song, but it, it has so much soul to it and really has this kind of like um, laid back energy to it. And then the song is remastered into a horrifying, like, orchestral thing. And it it, it, uh, it makes sense for what's happening in the scene because it feels more factory produced and more um, not understanding the music type of deal. And, you know, that's as far as I'll go with, like, um, spoilers. But it's a genius kind of, like, um, bookend with, uh, with music there. So the music, absolutely phenomenal. I know a lot of people... And the reviews that I've read or watched online, a lot of them stated that they <laughs> bought the soundtrack as soon as they saw the movie, which is a great sign of a great score. So um, great on that. And the acting is, I, I would even go as far as to say how I was blown away by like last year with like um, Hereditary, where everyone involved was on point. Um, and this is the same case where, Lupita blew me away. Winston Duke uh, blew me away. The kids blew me away. And I'm usually not a fan of child actors, but like these two killed it. Um, a lot of a lot of uh, emotional draining scenes that involve you know fright, sadness, tears. There's a lot of um, um, kind of like acting force that Jordan had to bring out of these people to display on screen in such. Um, such a dynamic way that it, it's very exhausting. It's emotionally exhausting uh, on an actor to bring that much out. And, you know, if you listen to Lupita in interviews, she even stated that, you know, uh, playing these dual roles is exhausting because you have to have like a different mindset for each one of them. And that takes some skill that Joel and I will never understand as a, uh, in terms of the, um, the art of acting, but it's just, it's just really phenomenal to watch People at the top of their game deliver, like I said, these very uh, kind of rich performances where you have Lupita on the mom side, the family side, 
She seems like a really nice mom. She wants to k- take care of her kids. She has a nice, playful relationship with her husband. It's just like, it's a really fun role to see. Excuse me. And then you have this terrifying doppelganger who has this scratchy throat. And she sounds like, um, almost like Dracula uh, sometimes with like wide eyes and like, you know, um, a really a different hairdo. And it's just like, it's such a different performance, but like, it's the same actress. And like, that that's just how great she is. And Winston Duke is great as well. Uh, uh, as one of our, our good friends of the show, Graham put it, and I will say it on here. So I'm, I'm not going to steal his, his phrase, but I'm just going to kind of go along with his phrase. Cause he, he nailed it on the head. He said, Winston Duke is my new favorite movie dad. I totally agree. He's such a lovable and kind of goofy dad that we all kind of grew up with, um, as kids. And he was just really, um, kind of lovable to watch. And then his doppelganger side, he was terrifying. Because uh, Winston Duke is, he's not a small dude. Um, I think he's around my height and he's got a lot of muscle on him. And so he's a, he's a pretty, um, pretty big guy. And so (laughs) he's really threatening as his like doppelganger, but he's extremely lovable in his, um, his family um, version. And it's just, yeah, it's just a a really great performance. The kids, once again, great. I think the supporting cast is really great. Never would have thought uh, uh, Tim from Tim and Eric would uh, do such a great job. But then again, once they, you put them in the right roles, they can really kind of shine. It's the same uh, same thing with Eric. He was really great on uh, that Master of None show. So I know they have their kind of like a screwball kind of like almost like otherworldly comedy because it, it's not even like um, comedy you would expect another human being to do. But like they have their own brand. But when they can kind of like um, divulge from that and do something different – they're really interesting to watch in film and other TV shows. And, you know, Tim does a great job and his wife played by Elizabeth Moss. She's also great. And their doppelganger is great. So once again, very, very demanding of these performances from everybody. Um, so uh, it, it was really fun to watch. Okay. Getting that out of the way. Um, going to Jordan Peele is going to be the last of the conversation. So the way it actually looks is really kind of breathtaking. There's a lot of like, nightmarish sequences they're really well shot and really well lit and just really kind of capture that that atmosphere of just horror and dread and then when they're outside um and not in these like kind of dark places and the sun's out it's still terrifying because of the actions happening and so it's just a really kind of beautifully shot in nightmarishly shot film to where it kind of has a nice contrast where you're like, man, I really like this from a technical aspect, but man, this is some creepy imagery. Like it just, it plays on both worlds and I love it. Okay. So getting down to Jordan Peele as, um, a director in this film and a, a writer. Cause he, he did both like he did with get out. Um, okay. So the overall directing of this film is super bold. It is ambitious. I, I, I kind of like the fact that, um, Get Out was a pretty straightforward movie with a bunch of um, layers to it, as Joel um, and I have pointed out on numerous viewings. This is kind of the same way where, like, it, it's it's a story that has deep layers, but this one is a story that has um, not a, really a direct path, but more of, like, these kind of, like, uh, um, and I, I know Joel's going to snicker when I say this, and you guys will have no idea what I'm talking about unless you've seen it, but a bunch of tethered paths that this um, this story takes, but it all comes together at the very end. So it's, you know, going in all these different directions, kind of keeping us uh, alert as viewers and wondering where it's going to go. And then it all kind of comes together at the very end and kind of leaves you with this pit in your stomach. And you're like, wow, that was a heck of a ride. Thank you, Jordan. Um, so from a story standpoint, I love the kind of creativity Behind it, um, I, I like I said, I love the old school mentality behind it. It's just a really well thought out movie with its characters, its plot construction, and um, really just kind of keeps you interested throughout the entire way. Because a lot of criticisms that I've seen online, I don't understand it personally. I can see where they're coming from if the story doesn't really hook you. But a lot of people say this movie's boring. I don't, I don't see that, um, and that's maybe because I think once the doppelgangers are revealed within the first like 20, 30 minutes of the movie, you still have like a good hour or so left, or I think even longer than that. Cause the movie's a couple hours. I was just more interested to see where it would go and just how it just got um, kind of deeper into the plot, into the characters and how everything kind of wrapped around. I find that stuff intriguing 
And I think the performances, the music, and the overall direction is what propels that to his explosive finale. If all three of those were terrible, if the acting was atrocious and the direction was all over the place and you know the music was just kind of like, this doesn't make any sense, I'm sure Joel and I would think very, op- uh, very opposite of this film. But the technical aspects are so good that I was willing to kind of go along for this um, kind of like surreal ride that Jordan uh, kind of took us on. And I, I do think it was well-written. A lot of people found it boring. A lot of people didn't like the ending. I can see where they're coming from because it is a different studio movie that most people are not used to. I don't know how Joel's audience was, but we had a person behind us leave once uh, the doppelgangers were revealed and the Lupita um, doppelganger was explaining to the real Lupita what was what was happening, like the actual plot. They were like, oh, I'm not, I'm not down for this, and they left. So I don't, I don't know why this is prompting a lot of walkouts. I think people maybe are just so used to like the Annabelles and everything where it's just jump scare, jump scare, where this is a movie that takes its time. You know, Jordan is not in any rush in terms of how he develops the story. This is not something where he's just like, I need to jump scare every five minutes to keep the audience alert. He keeps you alert through pretty, um, pretty out there and kind of inventive writing where we don't really see that in uh, horror movies nowadays. You know, last year we kind of got that with, uh, or not kind of, we did get that with Hereditary. But then you have all these other horror movies around it that's just like, okay, family goes in the house, it's haunted, all right, cool, jump scare, and then we leave. And I think a lot of people are used to that, and I'm not blaming them for walking out. If it, it, you didn't really feel like you wanted to stick around, you can, you can leave, that's your prerogative. But I do think that people were expecting one thing, they got something else, and then they left, and I, I don't think that's kind of fair. Um, at least stick it out to the end, and then if you have your, your thoughts about it and you don't like it, that's fine. But leaving when the plot is kind of revealed like that is just, I, I don't know, kind of disrespectful, but you know, it is it is what it is. Um, so, yeah, I, I think uh, his kind of vision for this film is pretty pretty amazing when you think about all the little pieces, like Joel said, that have to do with this film. There's a lot of, like, pieces that Jordan kind of lays throughout and then when it all comes together you're like that's very interesting when you go read the theories and you watch everyone's kind of perspective on the film then you want to go back and rewatch it and kind of pick up on all these little pieces and you're like okay this was very obvious and stuff but it's still you know a great rewatch because you want to kind of pick up on everything and just all the little nuances that he has as a as a director on this film so I think as a sophomoric effort once again he just knocks it out of the park it's a completely different genre then get out, um, and that that is great because I want to see him do different things every single movie that he does. Um, but Us is definitely a special movie. It's like what Joel said. It, we could make a three-hour-long conversation on just the the hidden meanings behind it because you know Jordan is a filmmaker that is very um, you know very forward with his movies. You know he makes these kind of very entertaining. Um, kind of snackable features, but he has a lot to say underneath. And if you really kind of invest your your time and your your mind to it, it's kind of a, a really great self reflection type of movie. I that I, I don't know how Joel feels, or I don't know how most of you guys feel, but one of my favorite things about horror films or science fiction films is the reflection that it shows us as people on how we are you know, terrible as a society sometimes or, you know, stuff within our own selves. Like I, I love self-reflection and stuff like that. And it really kind of puts you in awe as you're watching it and you're absorbing at the same time. It's just a really interesting experience. But I think watching it and just liking it, sitting on it, thinking about it, I think I'm, I'm comfortable with saying it's definitely one of my favorites of the year so far. It's already in that top 10 um, bracket unless something else can push it out but I'm comfortable with giving us a solid A and um, you know I, I I rarely do the pluses unless I actually feel it I feel like I need to do a second viewing um, to maybe give it that edge but for what I have uh, seen experienced and simmered on I want to give it an A it's um, if you're a horror fan please give it a shot um, even if you don't like it I will at least applaud you for giving it a shot just because it's kind of really out there and kind of uh, uh, inventive when it comes to the 
um, kind of horror movie space that we have nowadays. So, yeah, I uh, I really love it. So I, I can't wait to let Joel speak about it because I already know his thoughts on it. And so I can't wait to have him um, kind of spin it uh, in pretty much the same vein. So, uh, you know, Joel, uh, let the uh, let the wonderful people know what you, you told me because I was pretty shocked when you told me his grade and his thoughts. I was like, wow, this really – this really struck a um, a really positive chord with him. Yeah, I love this movie, um, and I and I I totally get what you mean by the whole second viewing. I feel like I need a second viewing to see everything in the movie. However, I don't need a second viewing to know my thoughts. Um, this thing engages me on a level that every great movie is supposed to, which is that it, it challenged me. It surprised me at every turn. Um, I think the genius of this movie is, I mean, it's not something I can fully get into without going into spoilers. And it's really hard to talk about this movie without going into spoilers. Um, I wish we had a few hours to talk about the movie, but I think the genius of this movie is that it keeps reinventing itself. The, you know, I, I guess I'm a little bit baffled by people being bored by it. I, I don't, I don't know where that comes from, but it's, I guess it's because it's more of a slow burn. It, like, it's definitely not like, it's not aggressive with its energy. It's something that kind of, it, it takes its time. And so I think people yeah, are just not yeah. used to that. Which is, which is sad. Um, because I think that this thing engages the viewer on so many, on so many levels, including aesthetic levels. That it's just it's it's remarkable to watch it unfold, um, particularly as the third act comes into view, and we get all the all the different avenues of the story. Now, something that I was a little, I had a little bit of a problem with with Get Out, which is why it wasn't on my top ten that year, was the fact that by the end we get a character who explains like parts of the plot so that um, that character can kind of fill in the gaps, and we get a and we get a similar moment here. There is. There is a a scene where we are explained to, like to fill in those gaps. But I've I've been going back to this idea that, uh, of of what Roger Ebert used to say, which is that, and I don't think he credits it to somebody else, and I forgot who, but it was it's most popularly attributed to him, and it's the the idea that it's not about what it's about, it's about how it's about it, and for me. That comes into play here because we are being explained to, but the explanation that we get is pretty devious. It's pretty it's pretty otherworldly, and then with the with the final scene, it undercuts the explanation entirely. So that basically, Jordan Peele is doing what Hitchcock always loved to do, which is playing the audience like a piano, and that's that's why this movie is so so great. You gotta, you gotta disconnect yourself just a little bit from your own expectations, your own kind of hangups with movies that are that that take unexpected turns, um, that that kind of disregard your own comfort level a little bit to just go along with the ride. People have a problem with doing that, and it's fine. It's fine. People have different comfort levels when when viewing movies, but this is. A very, very, um, it's a, it's a fun movie. I think that we need to, I think that we, I've, I've seen a lot of people kind of talk about how grave the movie is and how, and how serious the, the, the thematic strands are and, and all of that. And that's all true. But I think that we probably could do ourselves a favor by stopping, stopping, you know, kind of underrating how fun this movie is in terms of just watching the construction, um, uh, you know, come together and um, and witnessing this kind of plot construction because it's so again devious. I keep going back to that word because this movie is is incredibly bleak. It's very very bleak. It's much bleaker than Get Out. It, it ultimately, was a, a nihilist type of movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's there's no hope here, uh, really, and especially it comes together with that final scene again. I, it just one of the boldest final turns in a movie I've, I've seen in a long time. Um, the usual suspects who, so, um, although I guess <laughs> it's not really related, but anyway, whatever. Um, it's, it's a, it's a really bold turn of events that, that 
that takes place, but it's not even just the fact that you can peel this thing apart and look at it, you know, strand by strand and, and all of that. It's also a really, really, uh, keen story about family and about trauma. And that's the trauma part is what really surprised me because this movie takes a deep dive. I mean, the opening scene takes place in 1986. Um, you know, we see, Adelaide as a girl kind of come in, come into, um, the vicinity of her own, of herself, really of her doppelganger. It's a great scene. It, it, they come back to it, uh, with really clever editing. Um, and then the rest of the movie is, a, is in some way about her dealing with her trauma, this trauma of seeing yourself. And I actually think honestly that this is how it would go. If we saw, our doppelganger, this is how it would affect us. I don't think that we would be psychologically prepared to come into contact with a copy of ourselves. I think that, I think that that even the, even the concept is, is, is absurd and it's kind of far fetched. But what's, what Peel is doing is grounding it in this real world examination of trauma. And I think what he's saying is this is what happened. This is what would happen to you. Um, if you saw yourself and and encountered yourself and not as a mirror, but as an active like thing you can touch, I don't think that we would be able to process that. I think that I think that it would be as traumatic as anything else we were going to be able to anything else we would we would come across in, in the world. I think that it would be as traumatic as anything. And I think that what that's what he's saying. And so this movie is a deep dive into examining that trauma and uh, particularly when it comes back and it does come back in, in this really fiery, um, explosive fashion with this, you know, home invasion movie. Um, and I think that, but I think that also Peel is having fun with the audience by having all these twists and turns by opening up the world of the movie a little bit in the third act. Um, in unexpected ways that are really thrilling. And I love, and I love them. I, I, I love the, the twist that this, that this takes to open up the world of this movie to beyond this family. And I think that it's, it's really just a special piece of work. It's, it's a great piece of plot, uh, plot construction. I think that we underrate great plot construction. Um, and, and maybe it's easy to see it, but maybe we take it for granted a little bit. And I feel like we we don't need to in this case. If if Jordan Peele can win the Oscar for Get Out, he should be able to at least get nominated for the screenplay. And I really hope he does because it's a really bold and ambitious one. And it also has the courage of its convictions to follow through on those ambitions. And that's what's so important here. Because if it's a if it's a if it was a, just a filmmaker who went off, you know, like you think of for me at least, and this is what I just immediately went to, another home invasion movie that had this really, really ambitious concept that it completely wasted. And it ultimately turned into a series that opened up the world a little bit and, and uh, in better ways. But this first movie was The Purge, which I thought turned into this really dull kind of, um, uh, just had no had no balls, just turned into a home, a home invasion movie, a slasher movie, a, a stalk and slash thing with a lot of really obvious jump cuts and and, and all of that, it was just, it was dumb. And that's what I feel like a lesser filmmaker would have turned this into. We would have just had a third act of, of killings and that's it. We don't have that here. Now there's a lot of violence. There's a lot of killings, but there's a lot of other stuff going on here too. And, um, and so, yeah, it's brilliant. It's a brilliant film. Um, the performances are all stunning, but none more than Lupita Nyong'o, who I think, if she's not let, let's let's just make this uh, let's just make this pact. All right, Chase, if she's not nominated for an Oscar, we riot. We riot the streets. I, I said uh, the okay, same thing last not. year. And nothing <laughs> happened. <laughs> I know. Yeah. And and, and, and trust me, I, I don't think it is because if they can't nominate Tony Collette in Hereditary, they are, they're probably not going to go for this. But I, I actually think uh, that you're, you're more on point with the uh, uh, the first thing you said. I think it's more likely that. Not only it's, will it get nominated for screenplay, Jordan might win two in a row for the same yeah, category. Yeah, and and hopefully so because I think that 
this is an even better screenplay than Get Out. I, I think that he's doing a lot more. There's a lot more complexity in the storytelling. Um, for me, you know, again, I I really like Get Out, and it and it gets better on each viewing. But I don't think it's a perfect movie. I don't think it was as well rounded as a lot of people said. And I think that that's because, in some ways, it does become that stalk and slasher movie, just in a in a in a reversed fashion. Uh, we get the stalk and slash thing when the character's trying to escape his situation. So, and that was really cool. It was it was a reversal on the usual, but it was also uh, basically just framed as a typical kind of ending. Um, and here, though, it's not. It's not even close. We exhaust all kind of uh, avenues of stalk and slash stuff by the time it re- reaches like the last fifteen minutes, and then it and then it goes off on a much more thoughtful uh, road. And I think that that's what clinches it for me. And um, yeah, it's just a brilliant piece of filmmaking. And by the way, talk about visually. I mean, this is Michael Jalakis who shot It Follows for David Robert Mitchell. Uh, great cinematography in that movie. He also shot Split for Shyamalan. I think he might have shot Glass as well, although I, I don't know. Um, but he's a real up-and-comer. He's, he's doing great work. And this is just the latest um, it's stunning and it's also really economically edited, um, to amplify the tension, uh, without it, without going over the top or trying to do some, you know, hokey aesthetic thing where there's a lot of slow-mo it's, it's really economically edited and the music score is, is haunting and it's just, it's a, it's a masterful bit of tension, like just across the board and i just i think it's brilliant i love this movie and yeah i'm giving it an a plus i i have no uh no uh problems with giving it that plus i think that it's a really special piece of work and it's gonna stay at the top of the year for me i feel like it's you know i feel like for a while and um yeah i i just i love this i think it's i think it's a great piece of work so um in any case yes a plus for me. A from Chase. Guys, please go see us. I mean, it's it's doing really well at the box office, so it's not like it's struggling. But make it go over the top. Make it make it a huge, gigantic hit on the on the level of Get Out. Please, please see this because we need more movies like this, um, more ones that challenge you, that surprise you at every turn. It's it's pretty much destined to do that. It's it's amazing, and I I just I love it so. Uh, I can't wait for a second viewing. I don't need a second viewing to confirm these thoughts for me, but I can't wait to see it again. If they're smart enough to release it on 4K, and I hope they are, then I can't wait to obsess over that at home because it's it's one of those that uh, a colleague of mine uh, out at um, in DC uh, has already seen it four times, and has a five out of five from her, and 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 all of that, and um, yeah, she she nails it in her review, and it's. And it's just because it's such a, it's such an easy film to rewatch, to pick apart, and and pick apart in a good way. All of these different uh, narrative features of the of the of the work, and I just I can't wait to do that again. I I, I can't wait to to see it again. And uh, yeah, that's why I'm giving it an A plus. So, um, all right, well. Those are our reviews of us. There's a lot more to talk about with that movie. Trust me. We just can't get into it now. Um, all right. I guess it's as good as a uh, time as any to kind of reveal our April to you guys because we've got pretty much through June figured out But um, in terms of the review shows. But next week, of course, we're going to be reviewing Shazam. Uh, the following week is Hellboy. Yes, we are reviewing it um, right at the beginning of the film festival and, and – Speaking of the film festival on the 19th, yes, we have a big Handicap of the Festival uh, podcast. And then on April 26th, I don't know, nothing comes out. I, 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 I can't think. What are we reviewing? Are we reviewing um, – uh, what are we reviewing, Chase? What what even comes out that week? I think Paramount bumped up Dora and the Lost City of Gold that week, <laughs> and so that is what we're going to be doing. <laughs> There we go. No, no. Of course, Avengers Endgame. It's going to be three hours, and I can't wait. Uh, so excited. So big month. Literally a film festival and a bunch of superhero movies. I know that Chase is about to have a really good month. 
So, um, yeah, super excited. Can't wait um, for the month ahead. And uh, But let's wrap up this episode. Chase, where can people find you online? If you guys want to follow me on Twitter personally, it's uh, at Real Chase Lee. If you want to follow the podcast page, it's at Real Me In Podcast. Um, and, of course, with this one, whether you're listening on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spreaker, CastBox, wherever you get this podcast, please help us out. Uh, give it a like, comment, you know, give us suggestions, critique us. Listen, I, I, I don't care what it's about. I will I read everything. So even when they're nasty comments, I still read them. Um, and, yes, uh, Joel's correct. Next week is Shazam. And uh, I still do the uh, mini reviews for you guys whenever I review anything um, on my YouTube channel. I will put on there for you guys. So guess what? You got five things coming at you. You have this episode coming out right now today. Then you have, um, I'm going to have a mini review of Diane. Uh, no, no, excuse me. No, Diane's uh, two weeks from now. Uh, Storm Boy, The Wind, and The Best of Enemies. And then um, uh, the Shazam episode. So you guys are getting a bunch of content. Um, this week, uh, you know, to make up for the two week uh, hiatus. So, um, yeah, that is where you can follow me on Twitter and all that stuff. And then of course, uh, what's coming up in the week, uh, Joel, where can people find you? You can follow me personally on Twitter at real Joel Copeling. Um, that's R E E L. And then my name, which is J O E L and C O P L I N G. You can follow me on letterbox at J Copeling. Uh, please join letterbox. It's a great site. And then, uh, you can follow my writing at Joel on Film. I have kind of unintentionally taken a month and a half long hiatus from writing just because of busyness at work and life stuff that's been going on recently. But I'm back. I have reviewed I, I reviewed both Dumbo and Us uh, pretty long on both. So uh, go read those reviews. And um, you can also find some of my writing, especially this coming month, at DallasMovieScreenings.com. And I'll, I haven't reviewed anything for a while. Haven't been many opportunities, but um, – but they're about to come up, and uh, I can't wait. I'm, we're covering the festival, and I'll be writing reviews for all of those movies so um, that we're seeing. So, yeah, I was fixing to say uh, this whole month of April, just get ready, guys. You guys are getting yeah. a lot of stuff. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. Big freaking dump of uh, of a lot of things happening. So, can't wait. It's going to be awesome. All right, folks. Um, Chase, take us out. <laughs> All right, so uh, next week is uh, Shazam. This week was uh, us and Dumbo. Please let us know all your thoughts down below. Can I wait to uh, finally hear Joel's review on Shazam? He saw it uh, eight weeks ago, uh, it seems like, so <laughs> it'll be a lot of fun. But we'll see you guys next week for another episode of Real Me and Colon, a movie podcast. I am Chase. That is Joel. Peace out. You guys are awesome. Have a great day. Bye. <laughs>